This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us from remote locations over the Internet, particularly those of you who are listening from the Middle East. I also want to welcome new listeners who are tuning in on radio affiliates in New Hampshire, New Jersey, Florida, Montana, Iowa, Hawaii, and all across all 50 states of our union. Thank you for making us part of your news week. In just a moment, political advisor and defense expert Mr. Richard Pearl will be here to talk about the terrorist attacks in Paris, Bangladesh, Jakarta, and San Bernardino, and whether the United States is prepared to fight a long-term ideological war, a threat which, incidentally, Pearl was warning about long before ISIS became a household name. According to the latest CNN report, since announcing its caliphate, ISIS has launched more than 60 attacks in 20 countries, killing and injuring close to 3,000 civilians. And in the next hour, Richard Pearl is going to help us understand whether U.S. foreign policy is responsible for creating the very conditions which have allowed ISIS to be successful. But before Mr. Pearl joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Richard Norman Pearl was born in New York City. When he was a young boy, the family moved to Los Angeles, where Pearl earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Southern California. And following that, Mr. Pearl earned his master's degree from Princeton University. In 1969, Pearl went to work for Senator Henry M. Jackson, where he was a senior staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. From 81 through 87, Pearl served as the first assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs in the Reagan administration, where he was known for playing a crucial role in forging public support for the Ballistics Missile Defense Project, better known as Star Wars. Then in 2001, Pearl became the chairman of the Defense Policy Board Advisory Advisory Committee under President Bush. Given the data which was available at the time, Pearl was a strong supporter of the Iraq War and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, and we'll hear more about that later in the program. I also want to add that Mr. Pearl is an active member of more think tank organizations than we have time to go into today, including the Hudson Institute, American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, and Project for the New American Century. And when he's not busy advising our nation's leaders on foreign policy, he's busy writing best-selling books and offering commentary on popular news programs. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report foreign policy expert, Mr. Richard Pearl. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Pearl. It's my pleasure to be with you. If you don't mind, I'd like to start by reading a sentence in a letter that you signed addressed to then-President Clinton. Quote, Current American policy toward Iraq is not succeeding, and we may soon face a threat in the Middle East more serious than any we have known since the end of Cold War. At that time, your forecast was treated a bit as fear-mongering, yet exactly what you anticipated has come to pass with the formation of ISIS. So I'd like to ask you, what, in your view, could the U.S. have done when you first sounded the alarm to have prevented the current threat? I think the key to uh, dealing with ISIS now and the key to dealing with uh, terrorism then was American strength and involvement of a kind we haven't seen recently, unfortunately. Uh, We, when we fail to act, create vacuums. And into those vacuums flows uh, a terrorist movement deeply ideological, uh, intense, well-financed, and we're seeing the results of that now, When we don't lead, no one else leads. Well, it sounds as though you're saying that when we don't lead, someone else will lead. Well, others will exploit uh, the vacuum, certainly. Uh, What I really mean to say is no one leads uh, in the defense of uh, Western interests and Western civilization. Certainly there are people who are prepared to exploit Uh, vacuums to exploit uh, our absence, our weakness. Uh, Look at what happened in Syria. It's now more than three years ago. 
when a popular uprising began in Syria. And we decided, uh, the current administration decided to do nothing. Uh, that didn't mean that others decided to do nothing. On the contrary, uh, they saw an opportunity. And so groups that are now uh, uh, thriving, terrorist organizations, including ISIS and al-Nusra and others, uh, got the backing that uh, we never extended to people we could work with. And now we're finding it very difficult to cope with uh, with these organizations that were permitted to develop because we were not there to support organizations that might have been aligned with us. So in the end, is it our commitment to neutrality or being too passive that's creating the conditions that allow these terrorist organizations to step in? It's passivity. And uh, I wrote that very early in the, uh, in the current administration. Uh, there was even an element of it in the uh, second term of the Bush administration, a failure to take seriously threats that were evident and to design strategies to deal with them. And when uh, President Obama said famously we didn't have a strategy, I'm afraid uh, that has been characteristic of American policy for nearly a decade now, the absence of a clear strategy to deal with a threat that is palpable uh, and that entails enormous risks. And I'm not talking here about uh, uh, an attack like the one we saw in Paris where, where sadly uh, more than 100 people were killed. What I'm concerned about is the attack using a weapon of mass destruction in which tens or hundreds of thousands of people are killed. And uh, unless we can erect uh, uh, effective barriers to that, one of these days it's going to happen. So given your position, and you are a person who certainly is in the know, would you say that an attack uh, using a uh, nuclear weapon is inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. Uh, and it may not be a nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapons are rather more difficult to come by than chemical and biological weapons. But chemical and biological weapons can do a tremendous amount of damage. And, and so, for that matter, could a radiological weapon, that is, the use of radioactive materials uh, rather than the detonation of a nuclear bomb. All of these are areas in which uh, we know terrorist organizations have, have been working to achieve uh, capabilities that could do immense harm. Do you see indication that they're progressing in their aim? Well, it's very difficult to know that, of course. Uh, uh, and the absence of uh, uh, evidence that they have achieved a result is not uh, not proof that they have not. But we know that the effort is substantial. We know that the know-how is there. Uh, the formulas are not uh, uh, obscure. Uh, the methods of producing chemical and biological agents are well known. The precursor materials are traded uh, internationally. So we have to assume that uh, given the level of effort uh, that ISIS and others are making. Uh, it's just a matter of time before uh, one of these organizations, and there are many, uh, gets its hands on a weapon that can kill very large numbers of people. And also, the, given the level of financing we've been, been able to track. Yes. Uh, uh, for a long time, there's been external financing. Now, uh, uh, ISIS is able to raise very substantial amounts of money because it controls substantial territory in which goods and services are produced and taxed. Oil is produced and uh, sold on uh, uh, world markets. Yeah, and they have a viable economy. They have a viable economy. And they are governing. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, they've become a government. That's what the caliphate is. It's a government and viable economy. I think we have trouble using those words, but maybe we need to start. We have to take our first break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Richard Pearl. You're listening to the Costa Report.
I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top-tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best U.S. Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com, or reach us by phone, 831-622-7722. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and -and drag-and-drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most important impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? It's exciting to be a part of it. The growing enthusiasm, the sense of community. Business is growing every day. People coming together all across Monterey County to make this an even better place to live and work and call home. People like retired Air Force Colonel Terry Bear. I'm a veteran, and I believe in independence. I've lived here eight years, and I know that we've had safe oil production since 1947. So I'm concerned when I hear talk of banning local production. That forces us to import oil from places like the Middle East, giving away our money, our jobs. So let's take care of our own and produce local oil under the toughest environmental regulations in the world to give us energy independence, a strong economy, and more jobs. Let's keep Monterey open for business. Let's keep oil production here while creating jobs and increasing tax revenues. Learn more about the facts behind the science. Visit EnergyMonterey.com. That's EnergyMonterey.com. Paid for by Californians for Energy Independence. Cash flows and money move. The Money Moves show is dedicated to delivering tips and tools to help you earn more, save more, and protect your hard-earned assets. Host Pamela Fugit hetrick interacts with her guests and callers every Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Recent topics have included what is going on locally with health insurance, tips to maximize your Social Security income, how do you build an emergency fund for your family, Medicare 101 tips, how do you choose and pay for home health care, and many other topics. So tune in, take notes, call and get answers to your financial questions from Pamela Fugit hedrick on Money Moves, Thursdays at 7 p.m. That's Money Moves, Thursdays. 7 p.m. on KSCO AM 1080 Santa Cruz and KOMY 1340 Watsonville and 104.1 on your FM dial. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today was a foreign policy and defense advisor to Presidents Reagan and Bush, Mr. Richard Pearl. And before the break, you were making the point that ISIS has now formed a state with a government, a viable economy, citizens paying taxes, all the things that we would associate with a state. I I guess my next question is, if this is an Islamic state, do we need to declare war? I mean, that's what we normally do when a state attacks us. That's really a legal question, uh, whether to, uh, uh, to go through the constitutional process of a declaration of war. Uh, however we handle it legally, we have to be engaged in defeating ISIS 
And by that I mean uh, uh, preventing them from achieving the victories that have become a magnet uh, for their recruits from around the world. Every time ISIS takes territory, a village here, a town there, it inspires uh, people around the world of, of the Muslim faith uh, to join up with ISIS. And the great danger uh, is that without ever achieving anything admirable, uh, they can win enough battles and produce enough recruits so that they become a source of instability all over the world, as they are today in Syria and Iraq, and uh, it's beginning now in Libya as well. Well, people are naturally attracted to success, and they see them succeeding. Absolutely. And the uh, uh, their seizure of Mosul uh, produced a uh, an enormous flood of, uh, of recruits. I, I've had discussions with the, the Kurdish leaders who have said, uh, said the following, and I think it's really important uh, to take them seriously. They're, they're shrewd and they're living right there and they're involved in this battle. They said to me, uh, if ISIS were able to take even part of Baghdad, uh, a suburb, uh, a quarter of Baghdad, even if they were unable to hold it, it would be such an inspiration that they believe, the Kurds believe, tens of thousands of new recruits would sign up to join, uh, join ISIS. And it reminded me a little bit of uh, what happened many years ago in Vietnam when the North Vietnamese launched an offensive. Uh, they scored a victory that lasted 48 hours, and then they were repulsed. But that 48 hours was enough to create a political change of enormous proportions. And I'm afraid we have to worry about something like that happening with ISIS in Iraq. I think that's an excellent point. Now, we seem to be fond of characterizing this conflict as an ideological war. I I feel like sometimes we just mince words. But the terrorists remind us every day that from their perspective, this is a religious war. So help me try to understand how a country that believes in religious freedom can fight a religious war. How do we do that? It's a religious war in the sense that uh, the animating force is a vision, a religious vision. Uh, It's also a political uh, vision and a philosophical one. Uh, The idea that uh, Muslims are entitled to rule and will rule and uh, non-Muslims must be subjugated. The caliphate, uh, uh, the state uh, ruled by uh, uh, Muslims, is the goal and the objective. It's a a millenarian view, and it's an inspiration. We have to fight uh, the means they are using uh, almost independently of what is motivating them. So, for example, uh, uh, we have to contest uh, their military uh, activities uh, on the ground, Uh, remove them from territory they now hold, prevent them from seizing additional territory. Uh, We have to destroy the myth that uh, the caliphate is the future and demonstrate that it is a failure. And we can't do that unless we win these victories on the ground. The way to combat uh, the, uh, the successes they're having is by delivering defeats. Well and said. We, we, well said. We can't. We can't do that uh, as simply and easily as some would wish by by dropping uh, uh, by dropping bombs on hostile forces. Yeah, we seem to want to launch a video war. You know, do everything from arm's length, but it really doesn't work. <laughs> well, you can you can sometimes uh, uh, halt an offensive or even reverse gains uh, for a while. Uh, But unless you hold territory, uh, unless you can protect people uh, in the territory on which they live, you can't win this war. So simply dropping bombs isn't going to do it. Uh, And we seem to be, uh, or at least the current administration, and it sounds to me as if many of the potential uh, candidates for the presidency share this view, uh, is uh, unwilling to take the risks involved 
in helping uh, on the ground. That doesn't mean sending uh, large numbers of Americans, but it also uh, has to be more than simply dropping bombs. Now, as you know, recently leading GOP candidate Donald Trump suggested that the U.S. should uh, pause on admitting Muslims. Uh, Do you agree with Mr. Trump or are you more in Ann Coulter's camp who says we should pause all immigration across the board, not pick out particular groups until we have a clear and secure immigration policy? Well, I certainly don't agree with uh, um, with Mr. Trump, and I think he is actually done some real damage with the statement that is seized upon by uh, the proponents of the caliphate to to, uh, uh, underline their view that it is uh, them or us, that we are locked in in an existential war. In any case, it wouldn't solve the problem. Uh, The problems we're facing now have uh, have really nothing to do with immigration into uh, into the United States. Obviously, uh, we have to be concerned about uh, people coming to this country with the intent to do harm. But the notion that simply barring uh, Muslims from coming to the United States could achieve that result, I think, is really quite, quite absurd. Well, we, not too long ago, Michael McCall uh, said that um, uh, identified individuals with ties to terrorist groups in Syria were attempting to gain entry into the U.S. through U.S. refugee programs. Uh, where do you stand on allowing Syrian civilians who have fled for their life to resettle here? I mean, given our passivity and our contribution to uh, the situation in Syria right now, do we have an obligation to take some of these victims in? Well, I think we should be vetting uh, those who wish to come here and uh, on a case-by-case basis when we are convinced uh, that they do not uh, pose a threat, uh, um, that they are not coming to this country to do us harm, I think we should be prepared to take uh, some number. Uh, I don't see how we can maintain real credibility if, um, if we engage at arm's length, that is, simply by uh, 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 air attacks uh, in a conflict that we believe is an important conflict, and then refuse to give any assistance to people who have been um, have been harmed by the same forces that we're fighting. So I think we do have some obligation. That doesn't mean the number is unlimited. Yes, of course. And, and as you say, we need a better vetting system. Uh, to make sure that we're admitting people that are innocent victims of what's occurring in the Middle East right now. We have to take another short break. When we return, we'll find out how our relationship with Russia factors into achieving stability in the Middle East. You're listening to the Costa Report. As a scientist who works hard to stay on top of current events and trends, I know how easy it is to get caught up in the details of a story and lose sight of the big picture. What is happening to society as a whole? Where are we headed? Why does it feel as if there's greater instability, unrest, and danger in the world? The truth is, very few of us have time to contemplate these questions. And if we're waiting for our leaders or the media to paint a clear picture, well, we may be in for a long wait. That's why I'm urging you to grab a copy of The Watchman's rattle. Do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com. Find out why scientists, government leaders, and the heads of the largest corporations in America are waking up to a newly uncovered pattern of human behavior. That's The Watchman's Rattle at RebeccaCosta.com, a bestseller in 26 countries and a book that Richard Branson, Donald Trump, and experts everywhere are calling a must-read. That's The Watchman's Rattle, available at bookstores everywhere and online at RebeccaCosta.com. Greetings, KSCO listeners. This is Randy the Realtor with another real estate fact. Did you know real estate can act as a savings account, a tax deduction, an investment, and give you a place to sleep at the same time? But don't neglect it. You need to pay attention to make it work for you and not against you. Whether it's plumbing and electrical or making sure you have the right insurance coverage, take care of it. They won't maintain themselves. If you want more real estate facts, call me. If it's time to buy or sell a home, give me a call. 831 566 2590. Is your internet connection slow? Do you experience outages or dread calling customer support? How about your latency? 
Etheric Networks can help you. Etheric Networks is a Bay Area's locally owned alternative to DSL satellite and cable. Etheric provides fast, reliable, symmetric internet via our wholly owned network of towers covering the Bay Area from Salinas to Santa Cruz to Sausalito. We install a two-foot dish on your building and point it to one of our towers to connect you directly to the major data centers of Silicon Valley. Etheric directly connects to Tier 1 companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon to ensure high-quality service from your building to the world. KSCO Business Special. Business service up to 10 megabits per second symmetric for as little as $299 a month with a $399 installation fee. Etheric also offers high-end 100 megabit and even gigabit and 10 gigabit service starting at $599 a month with installation starting from $500. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. That's E-T-H-E-R-I-C dot net. On behalf of the more than 1,200 members of the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Cruz, we want to say thank you. Thank you, KSCO Radio, and our supporters for believing in our generation and for giving kids and teens in our community the gift of a great future. From everyone here at the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Cruz. Thank you for your generous support. Have a happy new year. And remember that great futures start here. KSCO is a proud supporter of the Boys and Girls Club Santa Cruz. Hey, Patricia, I heard you were setting up a new home office. Yeah, Sam, I've been staring at this home office for dummies book for hours, and I still can't figure out the difference between a LAN and a WAN. We'll call user-friendly computing. They can help you set up an internal home network. But what about my wireless printer? What about it? They have all the answers to your network, workstation, or Internet problems. They even provide outsourced IT for businesses big or small. User-friendly computing provides professional guidance to you for new computer purchases or network configurations. They also provide on-site professional support to your staff for everyday computer and network issues. User-friendly computing is locally owned at 505 River Street across from the Gateway Plaza. Or you can give them a call at 831-423-9653. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Richard Pearl. And before we went to break, you had made the point that one of the critical factors in winning the conflict with ISIS is the ability to hold territory and prevent ISIS from gaining more ground, because as ISIS adds more territory, uh, this is perceived largely as success, and it ends up becoming a very powerful recruitment tool. Um, As if things are not complicated enough, Mr. Pearl, we now have Russia playing an active role in supporting the Assad regime, uh, as well as these growing tensions between Russia and Turkey, uh, Turkey being a member of NATO. And, you know, no one could have anticipated that we'd return to Cold War-like conditions with Russia. So I guess my question is... uh, where did we make a wrong turn, and what do, what do we need to do to repair the discord with Russia? Well, I don't think we made a wrong turn uh, in the same sense in which we uh, failed to deal adequately with uh, the, the rise of the terrorist threat. Uh, we're unfortunate, and the Russian people even more unfortunate, uh, uh, because uh, Vladimir Putin is now running that show. Uh, He's a bitter man uh, who believes that the end of the Soviet Union was the greatest calamity of world history, not the rise of Hitler or (laughs) the deaths of millions uh, in uh, in world wars, but the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, And one expression of that bitterness is a, a policy of whenever he sees an opportunity uh, tripping up the United States, even if it's not obviously in uh, in the Russian interest. I, he delights in making life difficult for us. Now, in some cases, there are real policies, uh, but uh, it's quite enough for Mr. Putin uh, s- to see an opportunity to create uh, uh, pain and discomfort in the United States and among our, our allies. It, it's a personalization of global politics of a kind that uh, I, I can't 
think of any other place where we've seen it. Well, how do we deal with that? Well, we, uh, uh, first of all, don't kid ourselves into believing that we can deal with it using uh, the conventional diplomacy that, uh, that we normally use. Uh, when, uh, when Hillary Clinton, uh, as Secretary of State, announced uh, a, a reset, if you recall, uh, she had a button and she pushed it. Uh, and the idea, a little wooden button, the idea was that this was a symbolic resetting of the relationship between the United States and Russia. Well, it was a foolish policy from the beginning. Uh, it in no way uh, changed the outlook of uh, Mr. Putin and his uh, his colleagues. Uh, but for a long time thereafter, we failed to recognize uh, that uh, Putin was not our friend. He was not a colleague. He was not a partner. He was not participating in the reset. And so we accepted uh, one indignity after another. Uh, so the place to begin is by recognizing uh, that there there is no reset. Uh, there is no reason to believe that uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia is going to work with the United States anytime soon. Uh, although it may sometimes do things that uh, because they are in their interest, uh, which may happen to coincide with ours, will be beneficial to us. But we mustn't mistake that for an act of cooperation. Well, on Putin's side, he claims that it's us uh, who were never really uh, genuine in our desire to uh, make friends with Russia and form a, a good relationship. He claims that after the Cold War, NATO had an opportunity to admit Russia. And according to Putin, um, there wasn't any reason not to. The Cold War was over. Uh, U.S. and Europe no longer considered Russia an enemy. Everybody was trading. Um, did NATO make a mistake by not at seizing that moment to bring Russia into the fold? I, I don't think that uh, uh, was feasible, and if we had attempted it, I don't think it would have lasted. We did try to improve the relationship with Russia, and we set up a consultative mechanism. Russians started attending uh, NATO meetings. We re we limited the extent to which we invited uh, 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 other independent states to join NATO, and I think that may have been a, 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 a serious mistake. And in the beginning, uh, uh, the uh, the Russians seemed to take the position that it was perfectly all right with them if we developed uh, uh, NATO further. We didn't develop it far enough. Well, we but we can I, see Putin's uh, standpoint, which is, you know, if I'm your friend, invite me into the club, well, or, well, or 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 else you you've got a club that's defending it yourselves essentially from me, who you're calling a friend. Well, I think one has to earn uh, earn membership in the in the club, and uh, the uh, the Russians did nothing to uh, to earn membership. Did, was there a venue for them to earn that? I mean, I, I like the the term "earn." You know, I, I believe in that. I believe you earn trust. It's not something that's given to you unprovisionally. But but at the same time, I'm wondering: did was there a pathway ever created? Well, I don't think we. Uh, uh, we can look back and uh, and conclude that we missed an opportunity, if if that's the question you're raising. Could it have evolved differently? Um, I suppose if uh, um, if Boris Yeltsin had uh, had uh, lasted longer and had been sober uh, longer, <laughs> uh, because he certainly he certainly wanted to do the right thing, he was uh, uh, he was not successful. Yes. Uh, it might have been possible to compose a different relationship. I don't think it was ever possible with uh, with Putin. Mm -hmm. I, I think he is uh, he's obsessed with uh, uh, the desire to deliver uh, defeat and indignity on the United States. On the other hand, we do have a common enemy. You know, I mean, uh, Assad, uh, Russia, uh, the United States, they have a common enemy, ISIS. Is this a case where we can use that opportunity of having a common enemy to join forces? Well, we do, as a practical matter, uh, uh, sometimes do things that are, uh, because they're intended to achieve the same effect, that is, deal with ISIS, uh, it, it appears to be um, uh, cooperative. 
it's not driven by a sense of cooperation. It's driven by parallel uh, pursuit of, uh, of a common uh, interest. Mm -hmm. And it's only a, partly a common interest. I mean, we, we'd both like to see ISIS uh, uh, disappear. Uh, I don't believe that uh, Putin would, uh, uh, would be unhappy at all if there were other threats uh, to the United States that because they were not threats to Russia, uh, he could uh, actually encourage. So uh, we are not thinking along the same lines. We don't have the same, uh, the same values. And you have a bitter, driven man uh, making the decisions who has uh, taken the country uh, back to an authoritarian uh, regime. There was a brief period when there was some hope that it wouldn't be. Uh, but now, for example, the, uh, the press is completely suppressed. Uh, uh, political opponents are are, are murdered. You've, you saw the report recently of the uh, British Commission looking into an assassination in Britain. Yes. Uh, and they've gone so far, and it's very difficult for governments to say this. They they shy away from it. But they've gone so far as to say that, uh, that uh, Putin was almost certainly uh, involved in giving the decision to, uh, uh, to use nuclear material to, to kill... Uh, uh, a, a man living in Russia, yes. a, in, living in uh, in England. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I don't think we can look forward to much of a, a, a positive relationship. And not only that, uh, not only is Putin driven, he seems to be whipping up anti-American sentiment. Yes, um, absolutely. Which, which is now at, at a shockingly high level, given the reality, which is that we are doing nothing to harm uh, uh, Russian interests. Yeah, well, we're certainly not do acting aggressively enough to counteract this uh, anti-American campaign that is going on day and night. Now, we have to take our final intermission. We'll be right back following these messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash bigdata today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Hi, registered pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. Hormones. We hear the word all the time. When it comes to health and longevity, no aspect of our biochemistry is more relevant than the efficient and effective functioning of the hormones. The study of the hormones dates back 4,000 years to the ancient Chinese who used extracted substances, today thought to be sex hormones, from urine and used them medicinally to improve health and longevity. 
Later on, Indian physicians and their Greek and Roman counterparts recommended the use of seaweed to treat neck swelling, which we now know to be related to the condition of the thyroid. Our modern understanding of these essential and powerful biochemicals began in the late 19th century when the famous neurologist Charles Braun Saccard injected himself with a mixture of ground-up, hormone-rich dog testicles and reported a marked improvement in his strength, stamina, and ability to concentrate. Although there's over 25 principal hormones produced in the various glands, from a physical perspective, there are two major control points for all of them, what we eat and how we breathe. In other words, every morsel of food that enters our mouths and every molecule of air that passes into our lungs and into our blood exerts an effect, for better or worse, on our hormones. That means that no matter what our health issues are, by paying attention to digestion and dietary choices and healthy respiration, hormonal health, and ultimately all the markers of our overall well-being can be optimized. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool video. Videos too at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today was defense and foreign policy advisor to Presidents Reagan and Bush, Mr. Richard Pearl. Now, switching gears for a moment. You have been a vocal opponent of the nuclear agreement with Iran. Uh, Recently, it was discovered that Iran was conducting ballistic missile tests. And uh, some thought that this was a violation of the agreement. But the White House uh, is making a clear distinction between Iran's ballistic missile program and its nuclear weapons ambition. Do you agree? Well, I I believe the ballistic missile program uh, is intended ultimately uh, to become part of a nuclear weapons program. Uh, nobody builds uh, ballistic missiles that cost $50, $60 million apiece to deliver uh, 300 pounds of high explosives. So these missiles are clearly intended to carry nuclear warheads. Uh, the, uh, the Iranians are, will continue to work on nuclear weapons. So we have not... Uh, uh, prevented them from doing that. The infrastructure that they have built uh, will continue. Research will continue. Uh, it's entirely possible that activities will take place outside uh, Iran, for example, in North Korea, that are uh, uh, intended to uh, uh, ultimately to be part of the Iranian program. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's pretty clear that uh, these programs are very closely related. Now, it is certainly true that the agreement that was signed does not uh, uh, require the Iranians to abandon their ballistic missile program. That's because we allowed uh, the ballistic missile program to continue Uh, even in the context of this agreement, which I think was a very foolish thing to do. So should that have been part of the agreement, that they have to disband their ballistic missile program? Yes, absolutely. Why didn't we go for that? Because uh, the president believes that uh, this agreement, uh, and set aside for a moment the, the problems in the agreement, problems of verification, problems of... Uh, allowing uh, much of the infrastructure to uh, to continue, he believes that this agreement is somehow going to transform the uh, uh, Iranian regime from one that is hostile to the United States uh, to one that is willing to work with us. Uh, he's wrong about that, uh, uh, and it will become evident uh, o- over time. But he believes that the details of this agreement are not important. What's important. Uh, is the potential to change uh, fundamentally the relationship between uh, the United States and Iran. Uh, There's no reason to believe that. There's no evidence to support it. But that seems to be the motivating factor. So you seem to be saying that Putin's attitude toward the United States is similar to Iran's with respect to you can't really negotiate with them when uh, ultimately 
their objective is to uh, create mischief for the United States. Mischief's not a strong enough word, but uh, to create havoc for the U.S. Well, Rebecca, I think you can always negotiate. Uh, I'm not one of those who believes that you can't negotiate. But uh, if you're going to negotiate with a, a country that is hostile to our interests, yes. fundamentally hostile, then you, you have to get a damn good agreement to justify it. Mm-hmm. You have to get terms that uh, demonstrably benefit your national security. This is what Ronald Reagan did in dealing with the Soviet Union. Uh, he drove a very hard bargain. And in the end, uh, the agreements that he was able to negotiate were, in fact, in the national security interest of the United States. But agreement for agreement's sake is always a mistake, and especially uh, in a case like uh, the current one with Iran, because Iran has already received enormous benefits from this agreement, uh, financial benefits, political benefits. Uh, our uh, traditional friends in the region are terrified that we're abandoning them, and they believe this agreement is one indication that we're insensitive to their security concerns. So on balance, it's a, it's a very bad agreement. It's technically flawed, and it's politically and, uh, and financially uh, uh, catastrophic for, for the United States and its, uh, and its allies. Actually, one of the uh, GOP candidates was pointing out that the money which was released to the Iranian government is being used to order up to 400 new jets from Airbus in France. And he sees this as something which just should have been tied to some agreement as some quid pro quo. <laughs> well, look, uh, a lot of the money that uh, has been released, uh, or at least as much as they consider uh, uh, useful, is going to be devoted to uh, their overall policies, which include destabilizing uh, friends and allies of the United States, uh, supporting terrorist organizations like uh, Hezbollah, which they own, and Hamas, uh, this money is going to be put at the service of their uh, of their policies, hostile policies, dangerous policies, policies that are making the world uh, a much more dangerous place. And building ballistic missiles. Yes, indeed. Uh. You know, I I'm pretty confident that the Iranians have calculated that if uh, if they continue apace with the research and development and the permitted activities uh, under the agreement and the parallel development of uh, ballistic missiles, that in due course the two will come together and they will have achieved their objective. Oh, my goodness. You can't see me because we're on radio here, but I will tell you, I am shaking my head. Well, I am just wondering how how we're going to dig our way out of this mess. And uh, I hope that we're, we're almost here at the end of the program, but I, I hope you'll come back sometime and, and, and give us some hope on how we can dig out, particularly after we find out who the final candidates are going to be from the GOP and the, and the uh, Democratic uh, caucuses. Uh, it'll be interesting to see your take on their foreign policy strategy and uh, based on your experience in both the Reagan and the Bush administration, whether you think that they've got a viable course for America. Um, I, I, just before we go, do you have a website, Mr. Pearl, where people can go to get information on your books and uh, more about your uh, observation of U.S. foreign policy? Uh, no, I don't have a website of my own. Um, uh, have never had one. Uh, I've written a lot and uh, and Google will uh, unearth some of it, and 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 a lot of <laughs> a lot of hostile comment as well. Well, but, we'll make a point to put those links up on our web page. We get trafficked by hundreds of thousands of listeners, so we will make a point to put those links up on our web page. I'm afraid that is all the time we have today, but. Before we say goodbye, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Pearl. Well, you're very kind, and thank you for having me on your program. I'd love to come back one time. L- love to have you back anytime. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Richard Pearl today, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Do you agree with what Mr. Pearl had to say about ISIS, Iran, Russia? Has the United States lost its authority? And do authoritarian governments really counteract 
totalitarian governments, or is there really any difference at all? I'd love to hear from you. And if you happen to miss the full interview with Pearl, remember you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And if you haven't been to our website, we'll do it right now because it is chocked full of videos and book reviews and blogs and breaking news. And uh, all you have to do is go to RebeccaCosta.com. While you're there, be sure to check out our blog on Ralph Nader and Ann Coulter. Talk about bipartisan. I, it's amazing. We go from one interview with, with uh, Ann Coulter and then another interview with Ralph Nader. you got to hand it to our producers. They, they have a very creative imagination. And while you're at the website, don't miss our bookstore because when you click on any book on the bookstore webpage, it'll take you straight over to Amazon.com. And by going through our book page first to get to Amazon before you order anything, you help support programming like you heard today. Amazon pays the cost to report a small percentage of everything you purchase on Amazon, but only when you get to Amazon through our book page. And I do mean everything, anything you buy, a new printer, a Fitbit, a camera, even a pair of socks. No matter what you order from Amazon, they pay a royalty to the Costa Report when you go through our book page to get to Amazon to make your purchases. And the best part of all, it won't cost you one red cent. So please, this year when you're uh, doing your shopping, go to RebeccaCosta.com, click on any book on the bookstore page. It's simple, it's completely free, and it's a wonderful way to support your favorite weekly news program. My guest next week is former NASA commander of the International Space Center, Dr. Leroy Chow. He'll be here to talk about the race to make suborbital commercial flight affordable and whether China has the upper hand. Don't miss astronaut Leroy Chow next week right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report.